Hello, I'm Stephen Graham Jones, the author of The Only Good Indians, and I'm here with the narrator for the audiobook, Sean Taylor Corbett. When the publisher asked me, who do you want to narrate this audiobook? I said, I said, find somebody Indian, because this book needs that. And they didn't just find somebody Indian, they found somebody Blackfeet, you know? And so yeah. this is the, the coolest possible outcome that I could imagine. Oh, it was so cool for me. When they told me, I was like, wait, what? I get to, you know what I mean? I get to narrate this amazing book with, uh, you know, town names that I know that I've been to and it was a perfect match and it, I'm so grateful that I got to do it. I'm so excited to listen to it. I'm so excited for everyone else to listen to it. How did you come up with the concept for this incredible mm -hmm. book and the inspiration to, to write this? Well, I started going to Browning probably when I was 12 maybe 11 somewhere right around there my dad started bringing me up to the reservation i didn't grow up there i grew up in texas and so browning was a two two day drive so i started going up there every year and i've been going ever since but i've never actually lived on the reservation to get some of the stuff in this book um close to right i had to be talking to people i knew up there you know and asking, just asking them little stuff that i would that i would only know had i lived there uh one one cool fact so the you know the guy I go to to get my pronunciation for Blackfeet words, Robert Hall. No, yeah, I know Robert. He 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 gave me some of these words in here. <laughs> I know, and I I wrote. I mean, I, yeah. I I um I messaged him like Robert. You never believe this man. I'm <laughs> narrating this cool this Blackfeet book. I need I need uh I need some help with these words. And he's like, yeah. oh, that's funny. I was talking to Stephen, you know, and uh, <laughs> so he he helped me with uh you know Katoya six and. Yeah. Blood Clot Boy yeah. and yeah. you know Ponoka, um yeah. Elk, you know, so it's it's uh yeah. it was cool, man. It's it's a yeah. nice community. So I can't wait I can't wait for them to hear and, and to, oh, no. to read it too, you know. Yeah, me too. I'm um, very excited for that. It's a gift to have this language in this book and people get to yeah to hear it and see it, you know. Yeah. It's gonna be so cool to hear you saying it because Nine nine times out of a hundred, it's not going to be a Blackfeet guy saying a Blackfeet word on a recording like this, you know. But it's yeah, so cool. yeah, it's so cool. That's going to be the case this time. You know? I'm excited for the the listeners to hear this. Mm -hmm. It's just a cool combination of storytelling and native culture, and you know, like having a sweat lodge ceremony, but in a very contemporary way. Because what you've done is you've bridged a lot of the traditions with a very contemporary almost um, unexpected way that these characters who you wouldn't think at first would have this knowledge, but they're also trying to maintain a tradition while shaping it in their own way. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? No, new, no. I'm, that theme I'm in the book, you know? I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. That is something that I'm always trying to push. I think, I don't know, if we have it handed down how a certain ceremony took place in 1850, that doesn't mean we have to do it that way in 2020, because the ceremony wasn't always like it was in 1850. Back in 1600, it was way different, you know? Um, yeah. Cer ceremonies, rituals, everything, they change with the times. I think if a ceremony ever stops changing, then it's going to be forgotten. It's not going to have any use anymore because it's actually tailor-made for a different time. I think we always need to be updating stuff and incorporating um, maybe maybe a smartphone will be part of a ceremony. You know, who, who knows? Sometimes people who are who prefer the traditional ways will get mad when they see a small change or what they consider a misuse of an item or something like that on the page in a story. But in my, my estimation, if you're making the, the traditionals mad, then you're doing the right thing. That, that's always <laughs> what I want to be doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I liked how, uh, I don't think it's given too much away, but you know, using the police vehicle ampl to amplify mm -hmm. the, the powwow music, I could just hear yeah. it, you know, out there and be like, wow, this is a, that's a cool way to do it, <laughs> to have the yeah. song and the drum on there, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I liked, I liked piping it through a um, light bar of a police car, a patrol car. Yeah. yeah that, was, that was a good time. What was it, what was it like recording this in quarantine or in, you know, we ought to, we ought to stay at home? What was that like? Actually, this was one of the, your novel was one of my first books that I recorded from home. There was no pre time pressure. It was just really calm, and I got to spend a lot of time on it, and uh, I loved it. You know, so it was it was great for me. And I realized, you know what? I love narrating books from home. I get to uh, determine my own hours and do this. I like this. <laughs> but uh, it was real nice to to be able to have this book 
at home and keep me connected to that side of performing that I love. Um, those of y'all out there may not know, me and Sean were able to talk before he recorded and talk about which character sounded like what. And um, that was so helpful for me because I had been hearing the characters in my head for, you know, two years or something. But then yeah. to actually go back and forth with somebody about who has this accent, who is going to emphasize that, um, it was really, yeah. really, it, it actually allowed me more insight into the story, you know? That's really cool. It helped me a lot, too, to really find those voices. And that's what I do when I read the book, too. I, I list all the characters and really try to think about what they are before I do it. But I don't want to lock, lock in too much so that it's, like, mechanical. Wow. Yeah, because it, because if you lock into an idea and it's not natural and you're doing it, you're like, I'm yeah. just gonna force this, and I have to yeah. try to try to find my natural actor rhythm for that character. So I mean, it's the same way writing on the page. I mean, writing a writing this novel. If if I'm doing a character and I'm having them do things for story reasons instead of their own reasons, then I have to do the same thing. I have to go back and start over. If it's not natural, the audience or the reader won't buy it. You know that people are really good at detecting yeah. artifice. You know, I really appreciated the conversational aspect and the even in the narration uh, description. The style was very true to how people talk. How did you pick up that style of, you know, of, of writing? Is that just observing, you know what I mean? Like observing humanity and, or is that like a style from your writing that you have developed over the years or is this specific to this book? It's not specific to this book. It's just generally what I do, I think. But I wish I, wish I had a good answer for that. I don't. I always think it's just the way I write, you know? And it's yeah. weird to me when I find myself writing in a different way, like I'll be doing a story for an editor that's, you know, they tell me they need a story like this and I'll try to do it like that for them. And it'll feel really weird for me not to be using what I consider my natural voice. So, I mean, I don't, I don't even know the characteristics of what might be my natural voice. And I'm sure it changes from, you know, book to book, story to story, but um, I never am trying to do a thing a certain way. I'm just doing it the only way I know how, if that makes sense. Being a native person, I uh -huh. I hear it. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. I hear the speech patterns and the dialogue and how people communicate to each other with mm -hmm. humor. Yeah. You get inside these characters' heads and you're like, yeah, these, these, this is like real native stuff, you know, like communication. And people are going to get a real inside look into characters that are real life people. I mean, and, and yeah. you, can, you can meet them in Browning, Montana and they're, they're, yeah. or anywhere. Oh man, this was, this has been a wonderful, it's been so wonderful to get to talk to you. And I think we could probably talk for three hours here, you know, but you've got things to do and I've got things to do. So we probably better break it off here somewhere. But um, I'm excited to listen to this, man. I couldn't be more excited to listen to this. Yeah, man, me too. Take it easy, man. You too. Be well. Yeah.